back over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, when you find your place, stand with me please. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, begin reading in verse number 6. The Bible says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this evening as we pick back up where we left off this morning, continue working in our hearts on this subject, Lord, of giving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. I'm not going to recap the message this morning. If you missed it, I really encourage you to go find it and listen to it, set the stage and the tone for this evening's message. I didn't um, even get into my outline this morning. I had uh, so many introductory thoughts and notes that I never got to my main points, and I want to do that this evening. I really felt like this morning God gave me good liberty to preach. I appreciate you being easy to preach to. Uh, there are several subjects that are hard to preach on. Giving is one of them. People always seem to tense up. It's generally only the people that don't give that tense up. The ones that give like it. Hey, Amen. They love it. It's like soul winning. Hey, Amen. When you preach on soul winning, the soul winners love it. It's the ones that never go that get nervous. Preach on prayer. The ones that pray like it. The ones that don't pray wish they were somewhere else. Uh, but this morning we had good liberty to preach on giving and I made some comments to the church about feeling like I've really dropped the ball on preaching on this in a consistent manner. Uh, we were talking about this at lunch. We had some of the church folks over and I said it's when you've been saved since you were four, grew up in a Christian home, been in church your whole life, it's easy sometimes to make the mistake of assuming people know things that they don't know because it's second nature for me. I mean, I started giving when I was a kid. And so you preach on giving, it don't bother me at all. It just makes me want to give more. But the truth of the matter is, I probably ought to mention it more, preach on it more, explain it more. It is a very important Bible doctrine. So I will not recap this morning's message, but I would like to kick off the message tonight before I get into my outline by saying when it comes to giving, there are many things that you can give. For example, you can give of your time. Giving of your time is giving. All right? Investing in the lives of others, whether it be caring for them, uh, visiting with them, praying with them, mentoring them, discipling them, giving your time to the Lord is important. We could preach a whole message on giving your time to the Lord. We could talk about giving your talents of, to the Lord. And there are some tremendous examples in the Bible of those that had special skills and talents. I'm thinking about Bezalel and Aholiab over there in the Old Testament when Moses wanted to build that tabernacle and they stepped up and made all that furniture and all those things out of the gold and out of the silver and the brass and, and just amazing talents and skills that God gave them, that, that wisdom to do that. And they turned around and contributed their talents, their skills, their abilities to the work of God and that's important. Maybe you've got a skill, you may have several that you can contribute to the things of God. And when I say that, I mean doing things for the work of God, the ministry, uh, for uh, the furtherance of the gospel, for the glory of God, that is a skill or a talent that you might have. And we could go down a list of all those different ones, but if you've got one, you know what I'm talking about. But then thirdly, you can give of your treasure. This is the one that seems to be really dealt with the most in the scripture when it comes to the subject of giving. It's talking about monetary giving, financial giving. And in our text this evening, we've got in our text several verses that I want you to notice. But if I could just jump right into my outline and I didn't even get to it this morning. But the first point that I want to use tonight to pick back up where we left off this morning is when it comes to being a cheerful giver, uh, and that's what we're preaching about. Uh, God loveth a cheerful giver. That's the phrase that we looked at this morning out of verse number seven. We can be a cheerful giver because of the pattern of giving that inspires us. And I say the pattern of giving, the examples that are given to us in the scriptures, a pattern for us to follow inspires us to be a cheerful giver. 
The first one I'm thinking about is the pattern of God the Father. Amen. God the Father gave his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And no matter how much you give or what you give, you and I will never come close to giving more than God did. Nothing inspires me and encourages me to give to the Lord more than remembering what he has given to me. And can I say it? God was a cheerful giver. In fact, Isaiah 53, verse number 10, talking about Jesus going to the cross, talking about Jesus being slain as, uh, 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 in, in Isaiah 53, it says in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God was a cheerful giver when he gave his son, Jesus Christ. Not only was the pattern of God the Father a pattern that inspires us, but the pattern of God the Son. We're talking about none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. No less than five times in the scriptures we find in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ the phrase, he gave himself. He gave himself. God the Father gave the Son. But five times, Galatians 1, Galatians 2, Ephesians 5, 1 Timothy 2, and Titus 2, the Bible says that he gave himself. (laughs) And can I say it? Jesus was a cheerful giver. He gave himself of himself, not grudgingly, but cheerfully. In fact, in John 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus said, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. That grudgingly, we were talking about this morning in our text, that's taken from somebody. That's when you're given, but you don't want to. That's when your back's against the wall. And many times we give because we don't have much choice. Jesus was not that kind of a giver. He gave of himself. Jesus gave his life. He gave cheerfully. That is an example. That is a pattern for you and I to follow. Jesus talks about following in his steps and the example that we should go by. God the Father and God the Son set a tremendous example and a pattern to us of what it means to freely give. If God can give his son cheerfully, if Jesus can give himself on the cross willingly and cheerfully, How much more can you and I give cheerfully? But then secondly, this evening, we see the principles of giving that instruct us. The principles of giving that instruct us. In our text this evening in verse number six, Paul said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. These are principles of giving that are universal and are consistent. These are not exceptions. This is the rule. The law of sowing and reaping is a law that you and I can trust. It works. It works to the negative and it works to the positive. It works concerning sin and it works concerning obedience and righteousness. You always reap. Here are the, here are the laws of sowing and reaping. You always reap what you sow. If you sow corn you're not going to reap apples. If you sow wheat, you're not going to reap pears. You reap what you sow, and you always reap after you sow. And sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes there's a span of time, and you think this crop's never coming up, but the, the law of sowing and reaping, you will reap what you sow, and you reap after you sow. And you always reap in proportion to what you sow. And that's what Paul is saying in our text. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So if you take a handful of seeds and you go out in the field and you just sprinkle one or two here and there and then you go home and pray for rain, when that crop comes up, you're only going to have a little bit. But if you throw the seed to it, and I mean you are just putting the seed to it, after a while, you're going to have a bountiful harvest. And that is a law of sowing and reaping. Now, the context of this verse, he's talking about giving. I heard a preacher one time say, you ought not to give to get. I said, well, I know a lot of verses in the Bible that says if you give, you get. So I don't know if God has a problem motivating us to do that or not. Luke 6, 38 says this. You ready? Give. That's one word. 
give. And then the rest of the verse is what happens when you give. Give. Here we go. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. And running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. The first word says give. And the rest of the verse is the crop. The first word is the sowing. The rest of the verse is the harvest. Amen. And so I think God is okay with us expecting to benefit from the principles of giving because they instruct us and stir us and motivate us. I can tell you this, never outgive God. Amen. Never. Yes. You cannot outgive God. I heard it growing up. It didn't make sense as a, as a child. I hear preachers say, you give to God in spoonfuls, he'll give to you in shovelfuls. Yes. You give to God in shovelfuls, he'll give to you in wheelbarrowfuls. You give to God in wheelbarrowfuls, he'll give to you in dump truck loads. Amen. Amen. I get it now. Because that's how it works. That is the law of sowing and reaping. There's another law of sowing and reaping. This is deep. Stay with me. Pay attention. You cannot reap if you do not sow. <laughs> there will be no harvest. There will be no reaping if there are no seeds sown. This is the law of sowing and reaping. These are principles of giving that Paul the apostle is using in this letter to the church of the Corinth to motivate them and instruct them about this subject of giving. But then thirdly, we see the pleasure of giving that invigorates us. And that is the statement in verse number seven, God loveth a cheerful giver. The pleasure that it brings to God when we give stirs us. It does me. The prospect we were talking about this this afternoon sitting in my office. The deacons and Brother Adriel were sitting there going over the financial information for next week's business meeting. And I told them, I said, I don't profess to understand all of what this is talking about. I'm going to be honest with you. God loveth the cheerful giver. And I said it this morning, God loves everybody. Ain't it right? He loves everybody. I mean, I mean, Ephesians 2 says in verse number 3, among whom we also had... Our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. This is before we got saved. He loved us with a great love when we were still lost. But the Bible says in our text, God loveth that you're a forgiver. Why would he say that? if that ought not to invigorate us. I know this, running a rabbit here, I feel like I'm walking a tightrope. Sometimes I preach stuff I don't understand. I'm just gonna give you Bible and you figure it out. I know this in John 11. John 11. Listen to this. It's talking about Jesus. The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. You know that and I know that. But here's what John 11 says. Now, just, just stay with me here. They said to Jesus in John 11, verse 3, wherefore his sisters, this is Lazarus was sick, verse 2. Wherefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Is that what your Bible says? In verse number, in verse number 35, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, verse 36, behold how he loved him. Look at, look at verse number five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. See, he loved everybody. I know that and you know that. I'm just reading the Bible verses to you. I know this, we don't have any record of Jesus weeping and crying at the widow of Nain's son's funeral. And he raised him from the dead. He's weeping at Lazarus. And they said, behold how he loved him. I think it's no less than six times John the beloved in the gospel of John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> He said, but he loved all of his disciples. Of course he did. But I 
believe that John believed that God loved him differently. That there was something special. Are y'all still with me? They're standing around in John 11 and said, man, Jesus loved Lazarus. Behold how he loved him. And the Bible says that he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Did he love all those people the same? I don't know, you tell me. All I'm saying is this. Our text says, for God loveth the cheerful giver. That's what it says. I do not find in my Bible anywhere where it says, for God loveth a person that doesn't give. But he does love them. He died for them to get saved. <laughs> I'm just saying that the pleasure that it brings God for us to be a cheerful giver ought to invigorate us. That's what I'm saying. I, here, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the Bible is clear. God doesn't love the offering. He loves the giver. He don't say anything about loving the gift. He don't love the tithe check. He don't love the missions donation. He loves the giver, the cheerful giver. God looks down to see Christians giving to the Lord with a cheerful heart. God says, I love them. God sees you writing out that tithe check. God says, I love them. When God sees that little child digging the pennies out of their piggy bank to put in the offering plate, God says, I love them. When God sees that senior citizen on a fixed income giving cheerfully, God says, I love them. God sees you working two jobs to make ends meet and you still give cheerfully. God says, I love them. He, I love them. Not what they're doing, I love them. We talked about this last week, Proverbs 6. These six things doth the Lord hate. And one of them was he that soweth discord among the brethren. It doesn't say God hates discord. It says he hates he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates that person. Can God hate somebody and love them at the same time? I'm just giving you Bible. You figure it out. I know this. He loveth the cheerful giver. And I believe that there is a love demonstrated and shown from God to a cheerful giver that people that rob God just never experience. Number four, I want you to notice the purposing of giving that influences us. Did I get that right? The purposing. Look at our text, verse seven. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Let's just drill down on this for a minute. That word purposeth means to bring forward to bring forth from one's storage or stores. That's what it means. This is the same word that we find in Daniel 1 where Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. One thing is clear to me. You and I will not be cheerful givers without doing it on purpose. You're not going to be a cheerful giver by accident. Tithing for example, is based on a percentage, not a set amount. Aren't you glad it wasn't a set amount? Aren't you glad God said you got to give $100 every week and you only make $25 a week? You're going to be in trouble. You'd be in trouble if you only made $75 a week and you had to tithe $100 a week. You'd be in a mess. I mean, I know y'all go to Christian school, but that just don't work that way. But see, percentages works. Whether you make $200 a week or $2,000 a week, a 10% is 10%, straight across the board. And I'm not really going to get into tithing that much tonight. But I said all that to say this. Our text is the scope of the purposing. The scope of the purposing. Every man, verse 7, every man according as he purposed it in his heart, so let him give. Everybody. Everybody can give. Everybody that has money can tithe. And I know there's probably at least one Bible genius in here tonight. I mean, just a, an overwhelmingly brilliant Bible scholar that says tithing is Old Testament under the law. 
There's only one small problem with that. That's where you're wrong. <laughs> Abraham tithed 400 years before the law was given. He tithed off of everything he had, the Bible says. And he was a very wealthy man and he had gold and silver and cattle, much cattle. He was what we would say filthy rich and gave 10% of all that he had to the priest, high priest Melchizedek, 400 years before God gave the law on top of Mount Sinai. So that just kind of nips that in the bud, don't it? Everybody can tithe. Everybody can give. Everybody can support world missions. Not to the same extent and not for the same amount, but let every man give. In fact, God commended the widow in Luke 21 that gave two mites, saying she gave more than the other people that gave out of their riches. Jesus is standing there in Luke 21, verse number one, and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all, for all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offering of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. So it's not the amount or the extent of your giving, but the scope of the purposing in our text is every man. But then we see the source of the purposing. Every man according as he purposeth in his bank account. Is that what it says? The source of the purposing is the heart. When a person's heart is stirred to give, that is where the purposing comes from. And if the heart is not right, the giving will not be right. In Exodus chapter 35, in the offering that Moses took up for the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness, no less than three times in that one chapter, verse number five, verse 21, and verse number 29, we find references to take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart. Verse 21, everyone whose heart stirred him up, they came. And everyone whom his spirit made willing and brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle. Verse 29 says, and the children of Israel wrought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing. So we find the heart is the source of this purposing. That is why when your heart is right with God and it is tender and it is sensitive and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to your heart and he will lay a burden upon your heart to give toward a specific need or to a specific area of ministry. That purposing starts in the heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. We see the scope of the purposing, every man. The source of the purposing according as he purposed in his heart. But then you see the surety of the purposing. It says this, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. In other words, don't change the amount or change the decision to give once God has put it upon your heart. As he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying if God lays a man on your heart, give it. Don't argue with God. Don't negotiate with God. Don't try to get him down on that amount. Give what God lays on your heart, whatever you have purposed in your heart, so let him give. Well, real good. Try and talk down it. God on an amount. God say, I want you to give this. You say, well, Lord, how about we do this? How about I do this? I, gave, I, I told you the story one time about how that uh, uh, Brother Charles Keene was trying to raise money for that Mongolian Bible printing project. They was printing the, old, the New Testament in Mongolian. He came to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and he called me. He said, I want you to come up here. I want you to come up here. We're having a meeting. I want you to come be in the meeting. I thought, what is going on? I got loaded up in my car, drove to Gatlinburg, walked into this conference room in this hotel, and he had all these tables set up in a, in a horseshoe type uh, setup, and they started presenting the need 
for the New Testament in Mongolian. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I wasn't there but about five minutes and I figured out why he had me there. That man laid a sales pitch and a half on me for about three hours talking about the need and how that there's churches over there and they need scripture and we've got translators. We've got men on standby ready to translate. We just need the money. He gave all of us a professional binder and we opened it up. He's got charts and graphs and statistics and all this. It was just, it was amazing. But at the end of the day, he needed a check. That's what he wanted was a check. And he's talking about the need. Of course, I mean, I'm sold on the need. I mean, I'm sold that people need a Bible. I mean, you don't have to talk to me for four hours to convince me that a bunch of people halfway around the world that don't have a Bible need one. I'm in, I'm sold. And he said, this is how much money we need. If we had this many pastors give this much, and if we had this many churches give this much, this project could be done. I'm sitting there going, but our church doesn't have any money. And we didn't. I mean, we was as broke as Job's turkey. I'm not joking. Broke ain't even the word. We were so broke. We were so broke, Brother Adriel, what should I tell him about the milk? We were so broke that my wife and I were putting water in our gallon of milk and shaking it up to make the milk last longer. That's how broke we were as a church. And I hate skim milk but it's a whole lot better on cereal than water. That's where we were. We didn't have any money. And I'm sitting there and I thought, well, we can do something. Surely we can pray, trust God. And the Lord said, the Lord said, and he didn't speak audibly. It was way louder than that. He said, I want Pleasant View Baptist Church to give $10,000 toward this project. And I said, well, we can't do that, Lord, but we can do two. We'll do 2000 and that was, that was big faith for me. That was feeding 5,000 with a bologna sandwich right there. We'll, we'll do 2,000. And the Lord said, no, I want you to give 10,000. And I said, Lord, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> I know more about the finances of our church than you do, obviously, because we don't have $10,000. <laughs> That's exactly the conversation that I was having with God. And I went home, stood in the pulpit. And I said, they need Bibles in in Mongolia. And Brother Keene's got a bunch of translators ready. And God said he wanted us to give $10,000, but I told him we didn't have $10,000. I told him we had two. We don't have two, but we can get two. We can can do that. We can raise $2,000. I told the church, I said, God wants us to give $10,000, but don't worry, I've already told him we don't have it and we can't do it. We'll just do the 2,000. That's, that's what I said. That's how dumb I am. Stand in the pulpit, trying to be a spiritual leader. I look like an absolute imbecile. God wants us to give 10,000, but I, I told him we could only do two. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take up an offering in, what, three weeks, four weeks out. I don't remember how long. Three or four weeks. Y'all just pray. Just see where you can cut back, and let's all just chip in, see if we can't get $2,000 together for this Bible project. We took up, we took up fourteen thousand dollars. Fourteen thousand dollars. That was two thousand more than the two thousand plus the ten thousand. And I called brother. I called brother Dr. King and I said, "We got fourteen thousand dollars. You want me to mail it to you, or do you want to come get it?" He said, "I'm gonna come get it." One of our ladies, Sister Lydia Riley, Cherish Mama, she made this huge, big old one and big old like a sweepstakes checks, about that big, made out. And, she, and we posed. We stood by our missions map with Brother Keen when he got there. I mean, it was just a few dollars short, short of $14,000. Richard, what are you saying? I'm saying when God lays the mouth on your heart, just give that. That's what I'm saying. It was just a few years later that I was here. I was here. He called me. Fast forward five, six, seven years. He called me and said, they got the New Testament done. We got the New Testament done. I'm flying to Mongolia to pass them out to the new converts. Would you by any chance want to go with me? I said, let me pray about it. Yeah, I'm going. (laughs) 
And I flew to Mongolia and was in the room. When they opened up those boxes and passed out the New Testament in Mongolia. Some of those people have been saved 10 years, Brother Brett, never held the scriptures in their hands. For 10 years, they had sat in a church where the pastor would read a King James Bible in English and then tell them in Mongolian what it said. And I sat there in that room and I had cold chills. I had goosebumps so big on the back of my neck you could hang a cowboy hat on them. And I sat there and God said, this is what I was wanting to do. This is what I was wanting to do. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. When you say it, I'm saying when God lays an amount on your heart. When God purposes, when, you, when your heart has a figure or an amount or a need, as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. And then lastly, we see the promises of giving that incentivizes us. Verse number eight, and God is able. Boy, what a statement. Right after those leader kids got up and sang that song. Woo! All the miracles in the Bible, tell me what it is God can't do. Explain to me again what God cannot do. How many verses did that song have? About four, didn't it? Y'all sung two verses and then two more verses. About, about manna from heaven and about water coming out of a dry, dusty rock and God closing the sea back over the, the Egyptians, but not till they had all crossed over. Huh, is that what you said? I was listening. Tell me now, tell me now, of all the miracles that he's done, tell me what he can't do. Here's what doesn't make sense to me. We trust God with our eternal soul. And we can't trust him with our checkbook. That don't make any sense. Lord, I'm going to bow my head by faith and trust Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. Put my faith and trust to you. My eternal destiny is in your hands. When I die, I want to go to heaven. Open our eyes. I'm saved. Well, how do you know you're saved? Well, the Bible says... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be saved. The Bible says, who ever confesseth and, and for, that I'm saved. I trust God with my eternal soul. Great. Now let's give. Oh, no, I can't do that. I can't, I can't trust him with my finances. I, I got to control that. Now I can, I can trust him with my soul and eternity and all of my sins and all that, but I can't trust him with my paycheck. He might mess it up. Hmm? Run that by me again. How that makes any sense. And we got Christians, and I'm using that word loosely. We got believers that will spend the bulk of their Christian life in disobedience concerning giving because they don't trust God with their finances. Well, I tell you what, if the Lord would come down here and look at my bills... He'd give me a hall pass on this tithing business. Really? You got bills? Hmm, I wouldn't know anything about what a bill is. You think you're the only person in the world that's got bills? The promise is God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Um, don't get too excited. He's talking to the givers. Don't, don't jump in somebody's back pocket and catch a ride, you hobo. If he ain't talking to you, he ain't talking to you. He's talking to the cheerful givers. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye... Always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Mm. Mm. Verse 10, now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. I like words like enriched. I like words like 
bountifulness. Verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. I like that. I like this lingo. I like, I like where we're going with this. Words like enrichment. Words like supplieth the want. Words like abundant. Words like bountifulness. Words like he's able to make all grace abound towards you. Always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. I, I kind of like where this is going. The promises of giving that incentivizes us. Nobody when they first get saved have I ever seen get a hold of this right off the bat. It's a growing process. Your faith has to grow. I love it when new converts come up to me and they say, I tithe this morning. boy." Next week, you ain't gonna believe this. I'm like, I know what you're gonna say before you say it. You had more money to pay your bills than you had last week. Yeah, it don't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. See, because God's way of doing things is not limited to math. I tell you what you do. You explain to me how any miracle in the Bible is bound by math or science. Huh? Right. Part in the water? Come on. Walk across on dry ground? That's scientifically impossible. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called a miracle, you dummy. It's a miracle. It's supernatural. But how? I don't know, but he does. How is it, how is it that you up your faith promise and you got more money in the bank this year than you had last year? I don't know, but it works every single year. God loveth a cheerful giver. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the privilege to give. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. Thank you, Lord, for Bible verses that instruct and teach us to give. Lord, I'm confident that we've still got church members in here that's on the fence about this giving. They're just not, they're not sold. They're not convinced. I pray God that you do a work in it.